Good morning, everyone. Happy last day of February. I know it's a beautiful month at school, so yay, we get one more day. Uh, before I give my talk, I'd like to thank Mr. Chapman for all that he has done for us and all for Brooks. Mr. Chapman is a very, very special person. I think we can all agree on that, I, I am sure, Brooks. This is a person who is so pure and intent and so steadfast in his desire to help us all. I've been around the earth a long time, and I can count on two hands the amount of people who are as pure and as kind as Mr. Chapman. He gets energy from helping and understanding others, refueling his superpowers of compassion and empathy. The best part, he genuinely, genuinely believes he's getting back as much as he is giving. As an old guy in the Beatles named Paul McCartney said, the love you make is equal to the love you take. Mr. Chapman, as my dad used to say about people he cared very much about, was the bee's knees. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for all that you have done and given to this school. And I look forward to all that you will continue to do. Uh, I wouldn't be here in this moment right now had my belief in you and what you're doing in this chapel had been so crystal clear. So I'd like if we could all give Mr. Chapman a round because <laughs> he, is, he is very, very quick to acknowledge and give applause to others, uh, rarely uh, shining a light on himself. So I thought it very important to call that out. So we care very much about you, Mr. C. So uh, C Money and I were talking a scant two weeks ago out in front of the chapel. Someone had to bow out of the chapel talk, you know, as is wont to happen because something got in the way or uh, they had an issue. And knowing Big C and feeling like I would run through a brick wall for this young fella, I offered up that I, would, I could write a chapel talk, put it in my back pocket, and if it ever, the situation ever arose again, he can ask me. Uh, joke's on me. Uh, a scant six days later, he called me up to action. Uh, two days ago, right, or Monday at chapel. So here I am. Uh, I'm not the chapel talk you uh, wanted to see, but uh, I'm the chapel talk you need today. So uh, on to the meat and potatoes of my talk. Uh, there's this fantastic cons uh, commencement speech given at Kenyon College a bunch of years ago by an unbelievable writer named David Foster Wallace. Uh, it's not too far from my alma mater, Denison University, so it sort of holds a special place to me, and also in, in the canon of commencement speeches, it's up there. Um, if you don't know him, this is a picture of him. Um, David was an extremely influential American author, renowned for his dense and often incredibly complex philosophical insights, including his seminal work, Infinite Jest. Uh, that clocks in at uh, 1,079 pages, so I don't recommend that you start with that text, but I cannot rec uh, recommend enough giving a shot at his short stories, including Consider the Lobster, which is about the main lobster festival, or his writings and musings on tennis, particularly Rafael Nadal, or I'm sorry, Roger Federer in the New York Times. Uh, easy and light bite to read, uh, and, and just a beautiful, beautiful works. Uh, so in this commencement speech, he opens the address with this following parable. There are these two young fish swimming along, and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way, who nods at them and says, morning boys, how's the water? And the two young fish swim on for a bit, and then eventually one of them looks over and says, what the heck is water? And so what he's trying to say with this parable, and what I want to explore with this talk, is the significance of sort of being consciously aware of our surroundings and the way we think of and operate within this framework. Wallace emphasizes the importance of choosing how we construct meaning from experience, urging those graduates at Kenyon to be mindful of the default setting of self-centered thinking and life and to exercise empathy, one of our school core school values, and awareness in the mundane aspects of life. This speech is celebrated for its profound insight into the challenges of daily living and the potential for achieving a fully fulfilling life through conscious thought and empathy for others. And so with that is why I'm here today to talk about, to handle one of the bigger challenges of our daily lives on Brooks campus, something that keeps us on autopilot, slowly walking through school, and that is our cell phones. So what I'm here to talk about today is how, is how many of you, and don't be afraid uh, to throw up your hand if you feel this is a yes, this is for everyone, adults and students, uh, feel that this cell phone helps you procrastinate from doing work. All right, 
how many of you occasionally get less sleep than you should due to the cell phone? Fairly good answer. How many of you feel that YouTube, Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime, TikTok, Snap, Insta, Be Real, and on and on and on, uh, and Clash Clans and all uh, mobile games, causes you to put off work until you realize it's getting way too late and you need to get the work done, so you rapid fire pound it out and then try to go to sleep? All right, seems like a pretty good approximation. All right, so thank you so much for all of you uh, for being open and honest. Uh, and if you couldn't, that's OK. Um, I want you to know this talk isn't about shaming anyone. And it certainly uh, isn't about me being holier than all of you. I suffer from the same. I sit in the same space. I deal with the same challenges. You're all exceptionally smart and talented and strong individuals. Uh, the only thing we have as adults up here uh, and out there is that uh, we were just born before a lot of this. Uh, so we have perspective and we have wisdom. Um, I guess we could call our time pre-internet and pre-pandemic, and now you all have grown up post-internet. Smartphones in general really only came on the scene at Brooks School about 10 years ago. I distinctly remember an event uh, that was going sideways and everybody's cell phones came out because Snapchat had just come out and they all recorded it. Um, so, we're all wrestling with this challenge. And it was, I'm not saying uh, before that time it was better. I'm just acknowledging it. I'm here because I care deeply about you all. And I feel like we're all coming around to the fact, adults and uh, students, uh, that smartphones are specifically, and partly a number of applications to the fact, um, have developed, that were developed with smartphones are sort of like what the cigarette industry was when I was your age. Um, we, the industry knew their product caused health issues and kept it a secret and kept promoting it to children and young adults. And I are really honestly, hand on heart, want the best for all of us. And so my hope is with this talk to A, make you aware of the trade-off of spending time online can hurt you in whatever you want to do, be, or accomplish, and B, give you some thoughts on how you might be able to break the chains from the onslaught that is the delicious, enticing world of your phone and the internet. So let's break down the science of why we are all so entranced by these devices in a way that's easy to understand, and why these applications are basically like ice cream. Firstly, there's the basics of dopamine. Dopamine is a chemical in the brain, for those of you who have taken biology, often called the feel-good neurotransmitter. It's released when you experience something pleasurable, like eating your favorite food, hanging out with friends, or even getting likes on a post online. It motivates you to repeat those behaviors because you want to feel good. So how does social media use this, and how do games use this? Well, the platforms like Instagram, TikTok, and Clash of Clans are designed to trigger these dopamine releases. You may not be able to recall the first time you used social media, but it was a massive rush of dopamine to your brain, like a massive one, very enticing. As you continue to use social media, those dopamine respondents tend to level off or lower down. But we're always chasing that dopamine. Uh, and the objective of the games is to keep you engaged and keep you coming back for more. So what they do is use a bunch of tools. Uh, the first one's called intermittent rewards. It's kind of like pulling a slot machine. That's why everybody goes to a casino. Um, you don't win every time you pull the lever, but you win often enough to keep you playing. Social media works similarly. You don't find interesting content every time you scroll, but you find it often enough to keep you scrolling. And if you're like me, you scroll and get really, really angry and then put your phone away. This unpredictability is key. If you know every fifth post was interesting, the effect would wear off pretty quickly. But not knowing when the next reward come keeps you engaged. Likes, comments, sharing, getting a like, it's like uh, a post as a direct reward, triggering that dopamine release. It feels good when others approve or acknowledge what you've shared, encouraging you to post more to get that feeling again. Infinite Scroll, which was developed by Facebook nine years ago, and Autoplay, features like um, keep you from stopping those cues, stopping for a moment and thinking, meaning there's really no natural point for you to pause and decide whether to continue. The objective and design is to keep you engaged longer than you might have intended, always chasing the next dopamine hit from discovering something new and interesting. So there's a psychological aspect of this. Social media taps into the human desire for social connection and validation, something deeply, deeply, deeply uh, needed by uh, your co age cohort. 
By integrating these psychological elements within technological features that exploit our brains, response to dopamine, platforms ensure users stay engaged often longer than they intended. It's a cycle of anticipation, seeing new notifications, action, scrolling, and reward, finding something enjoyable or receiving social validation. Like mice in a maze, they have us trapped. So wrapping up the science portion of our journey today, Instagram, TikTok, mobile gaming, and similar platforms are engineered to make the experience of using them addictive. They cleverly use the combination of intermittent rewards, dopamine release to keep you scrolling. It's not just about the content itself, but it's about how they present this content that influences your brain chemistry and behavior patterns. Understanding this can help you be more mindful about your use of social media, recognizing when you might be scrolling more out of habit and anticipation of rewards than actual enjoyment or fulfillment. Understanding this, um, the harm social media can cause, particularly in light of recent state cases against Meta, there was, there's been a lot of litigation recently. Uh, about 35 states opened up a case against Meta, particularly because they have the deepest pockets, uh, accusing them of a whole host of uh, indiscretions. Uh, there's also, on Monday, we're here, there are oral arguments in the Supreme Court uh, about social media as well and relates to uh, local cases in Florida and Texas. Um, in light of these cases, uh, of Meta, which is WhatsApp, Insta, and Facebook, uh, it requires us to address both the psychological effects and the legal concerns. So let's break it down. So in the discovery phase, there was a whistleblower. You may have seen it on 60 Minutes, uh, but studies have shown, um, and Facebook slash Meta slash Instagram knew this, that excessive social media use can be li linked to negative mental health outcomes, such as increased feelings of anxiety, depression, and loneliness. For teenagers who are at a crucial stage, that's you, of developing their, your identities and self-esteem, constant comparison to the often idealized versions and lives of others on social media really can exacerbate those feelings. And I am blown away whenever I scroll through the amount of manipulation of uh, photos by celebrities uh, to make themselves appear, th appear thinner, or sort of the fake constructs that people go through, whether uh, you, know, you can rent a jet by an hour so you can take a picture of yourself on it, um, it's really quite wild. Also, we have sleep disruption. We know all that because I see what time you all go to bed at night uh, just looking every morning at uh, internet trends. Spending a lot of time on social media, especially before bed, can interfere with sleep patterns. The blue light from screens can suppress, suppress the production of melatonin, which helps us sleep and uh, helps our sleep cycle and, and regulates us and makes it harder and, uh, to fall asleep. Then we have addiction. The design of social media platforms, le leveraging those dopamine-driven uh, feedback loops, which I talked about earlier, uh, can create addictive patterns of behavior. Uh, users may find themselves compulsively checking their devices for updates and notifications, leading to excessive screen time that displaces other activities, like engaging at Brooks. Privacy issues, and this is a huge one. Teenagers, you may not be aware, but to the extent of the personal information that these companies share with each other and share with other, uh, other products, this can lead to privacy breaches and manipulation through targeted content to you. So now, back to the legal uh, concerns against uh, the state cases against Meta. Uh, basically, they say that they failed to protect young users. The lawsuit accuses Meta of not doing enough to protect young users from harmful content and experiences on their platform. This includes failure to adequately police content that could lead to body image issues, bullying, and mental health pr uh, problems, misleading parents and the public, exploitation for profit, and uh, designing the platform to maximize engagement. That's their objective, is to keep their eyeballs on the platform so they make more ad revenue. It's all about the money. It's not about you. So with all that fun stuff said, what can we do? Well, first, we can understand the harmful effects of social media and games and take this first step. It's important to approach social media use with mindfulness, setting boundaries for yourself, and taking regular breaks. Engaging in offline activities, fostering face-to-face -face relationships on campus, and maintaining a healthy balance between your digital life and your in real life are crucial for well-being. So why, may you ask, how can I try to lessen the amount of time on my phone, Mr. Dobbins? I think I'm isolating myself in my room too much. Well, that is a great question. I'm so glad you asked. We can't be like, uh, next picture, Ulysses, right? So Ulysses in the Odyssey, he really wanted to hear the siren sounds, but uh, knowing that the sirens would cause the ship to crash to shore, lashed him, asked to be lashed to the mast while everybody covered their ears so he could hear this beautiful sound. Well, I'm not asking you to lash, have your friends lash you to the flagpole out by thorn, but I will say there are some tools and techniques where you can kind of mitigate the amount of use you have. 
So first of all, if you're trying to study in your room, in the library, in a study hall area, studies have shown putting the phone out of sight will drastically uh, drop the amount of insistence of you picking that phone up. Put it in your backpack, put it in your desk, put it out of sight, and there's a 60% drop in the chance that you might actually use that phone. It gives you more time to focus on your studies and academics, pound it out, then you can finish up, do 10 o'clock check-in, hang out with your friends, talk to them, enjoy yourself and get to bed at a nice hour. If you're uh, trying to um, uh, just uh, limit the amount of hours on your phone, there's a settings in iPhone and Android where you can buy apps, say how many hours per day you want to be able to use that app, and it can block you. There are also another uh, bunch of apps. Uh, the next step, which is pretty drastic, but it's shown to really work, is this sort of digital detox. You delete the apps from your phone, you can use them on your laptop. It's shown that it's significantly on, when you use it on a laptop versus your phone, you spend way less time using this. And again, this is for adults and students. Pre-pandemic to post-pandemic, the amount of time we are spending on our mobile phones has quadrupled. That's students and adults. So uh, next one is um, uh, seeking real life engagement on campus. And that's uh, the beauty of this school is we're all really proximate to each other. We have an abundance of opportunities to allow you to try out new things, engage with groups, both large and small, and seek out personal connection with people. Since the pandemic, I see that all of us are, are more deeply involved in texting and emailing rather than talking in real life. So let me show you an example of the difference in the experience of texting someone versus actually talking to them. So I'm going to pretend to be a student and, uh, who just got into Denison University, my alma mater, and Mr. Campbell will be playing himself. He's very good at this for this exercise. So behold the magic of acting. Uh, here's what I text to Mr. Campbell as a student. Yo, Mr. C, what up, my dog? I got into Denison. Fire emoji, fire emoji, fire emoji, horn of celebration emoji. So instead of texting, Hold on to your hats as well, because we're going to continue to use theatrical suspension of disbelief. So you may see me as a student. I know I don't look like a student and not a man as old as Cole. So here we go. Um, I'm coming in. Mr. Campbell, I've got great news. I got into Denison. Why? Are you serious? I am totally serious. I'm so Thank you so much. I just want you to know I couldn't have done it without you. All those nights where I was bawling in your, in your office and just saying I, I couldn't do it, you believed in me, and I really, really sincerely appreciate it. All right. Hey, thanks, my dog. You're my dog, dog. <laughs> we can see that the two interactions are vastly different, right? There's an emotional response. There's a build of, and, and level of uh, thanks and gratitude. There's trust that we have with each other. So uh, my hope is, going forward, uh, if you have an opportunity to communicate with an adult or another student, try to seek them out in real life. It can be a way better reaction. Uh, it's a lot better for your mental health. It's a lot better for the person's mental health. Um, and it helps build uh, the community that we uh, know and love so much at Brooks. So uh, in conclusion, and, and echoing David Foster Wallace's sentiments in uh, his commencement speech, we're reminded that we have agency to change our default settings of isolation and passivity. We can't just sit around waiting for life to come to us. We can go out. We can experience it, experience all the joy and beauty that life to has to offer. So uh, with that, thank you very much and have a great rest of your day.